I'm Annie Fisher, the Vice President of the American Literary Translators Association. I'm excited to open this video commemorating the shortlist and winner of the 2020 Lucian Strike Asian Translation Prize. 2020 marks the 11th year for the Lucian Strike Prize, which recognizes the importance of Asian translation for international literature and promotes the translation of Asian works into English. Strike was an internationally acclaimed translator of Japanese and Chinese Zen poetry, a renowned Zen poet himself, and a former professor of English at Northern Illinois University. Welcome everyone, we are excited to have you here to celebrate with us. The judges for the 2020 Lucian Strike Asian Translation Prize are No Anotai, John Balcom, and E.J. Ko, who selected the shortlist and winner, who will receive a $6,000 prize. We will be hearing from No Anotai with the blurbs for the shortlisted titles, and then we will go to E.J. Ko for the announcement of the winner of the 2020 Lucian Strike Asian Translation Prize, followed by a brief conversation and reading with the winner. Please feel free to follow along the awards brochure found in the description, and we encourage you to purchase these titles from the bookshop.org page, also found in the description. When you do, you support local bookstores. Engage with us in the comments wherever you're watching, and tag us at LitTranslate on Twitter and use the hashtag Alta43. And now I'll turn over to our judges. And the shortlisted titles for this year's Lucian Strike Prize for Asian Literature and Translation are First up, we have Hysteria by Kim Yi Dum, translated from the Korean by Jake Levine, So Eun Seo, and Heji Choi, and available from Action Books. These poems against rationality, lyricism, and polite society resist established Korean literary culture in the tradition of Korean feminist poetics, even as they reckon with both political and personal revolutions. Next up, we have No Poetry by Cho Chen Si, translated from the Chinese by Yun Te Huang and available from Polymorph Editions. In these poems, there's a playfulness with convention, both literary and orthographical, and with the reader's expectations for the logical and the linear. The bilingual edition allows us to appreciate how Chen Si lays out words across the page, uses geometrical shapes, and examines the shape of Chinese ideograms. Through Huang's skill, no poetry has not also meant no translation. And finally, we have Pioneers of Modern Japanese Poetry, which features poems by Muro Saisei, Kaneko Mitsuhara, Miyoshi Tatsuji, and Nagase Kiyoko. These were translated from the Japanese by Takako Lento, and the collection is available from Cornell University Press. The collection offers a substantial selection of work from these four poets who are seminal in the development of modern poetry in Japan and it succeeds in rendering their range of voices distinctly. The collection is further enhanced with a general introduction, while each poet's work is staged with a preface on his or her life and career. Congratulations to all of those who made the shortlist from me, John Balcom, and E.J. Cole, and to everyone who submitted and made the prize possible. We thank you. We'll see you next year. This year's winner of the Lucian Strike Translation Prize is Hysteria by Kim Edom, translated by Jake Levine, Sol Soon, and Heji Choi, published by Action Books. And I'd like to invite the winners to turn on their cameras. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this is amazing. So uh, I, I'm just going to open up and dive right in, but uh, I'd love to talk a bit about how this book came out right before the Me Too movement in Korea. Uh, we'd also talked a bit about the Gangnam murder and continuing a tradition of Korean feminism. Um, please do share. This book came out uh, right before the popular discourse on feminism really kicked into high gear in Korea. Um, I think before maybe like 2015, 2016, like the word feminism would have been uh, barely recognizable in, in national discourse. But um, during the mid 2010s, like around that time, a lot of things happened that uh, kick-started uh, feminism's return to Korea um 
with events uh, such as the Me Too movement and the infamous murder in Gangnam where uh, this lady was murdered in a public restroom in the middle of the day in like a very populated area um, where it should have been safe but it wasn't and um, the murder repeated many times to the police that uh, he was waiting for a woman to come by because women like ignored him all the time and uh, Korean authorities denied that it was a hate crime and uh, the reaction to that kind of like denial and the um, the disillusion of safety was so big that uh, people like women from all over Korea responded like really heavily to that and it made national news and from then on I think like the floodgates had opened to really welcome feminism back into popular national discourse and um, Hysteria was published like a little bit before that as like this kind of like sentiment uh, was brewing and um, I think it is an indicator of that kind of current happening around that time. There's also a lot of, I was just thinking about this, there's a lot of situations in the book, there's tons of situations in the book that are like everyday circumstances that women have to go through, like for instance riding the subway and being touched inappropriately. Um, yeah, I remember, um, sorry. <laughs> Would you, would you like to oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I remember reading the book and this was when I came back to Korea after going to high school in America and I had known about feminism but it was very much from like an American perspective and like all the literature that I had read about fem feminism was in English and then I came to Korea and like um, encountered these ideas and I read this book and I was extremely surprised by how differently feminism came uh, came to like seem to me when it was applied to a life that I could recognize and it's like much more closer to my reality and for me personally that was uh, very meaningful. Thank you that was uh, wonderfully said and done. Uh, I, I have a second question for you guys I know it's it's quite a bit but uh, I'm so drawn to how the poems, they accordion uh, through the lines that compress with emotion and others that expand across poems with multitudinous voices. Uh, can you speak to the performance aspect that a reader encounters in these poems? So Edom, Edom's first book in English was translated by Ji Yun Lee, Don Mi Chue, and Johannes Warnson. And so like, Kimmy has two books, but was two books of poetry with six different translators. And so it kind of, it kind of fits at, in my introduction, in the introduction that we wrote together. And, and there's a famous painter, Chung Kyung Ja in Korea, who kind of like paints herself into all these different situations of women that she saw when she was traveling. And she kind of paints the same like self-portrait of herself as like the African woman in the savannah and like self-portrait of herself as like on stage doing cats on Broadway. And I'm like this, for Edom in her poetry also, she embodies all these different personas in her poetry. And so I think, I think Johanna said in the when the first book came out, like it makes sense to have multiple translators for some poets because they have multiple voices you know her voice is a voice of the many yeah it's it's really incredible to to witness all all those different facets just in that one book and across translations and Hedgy, did you want to speak a little bit about the challenges you guys faced as translators yeah um in most other cases of translation, what I typically have trouble with is translating ambiguity. So if there's something that in Korean could mean multiple things, then should I try to retain all of those possibilities in the English? Is that possible? Or should I like resolve it to what I think is the most interesting or significant or perhaps likely meaning that was in the Korean? But with hysteria, I think it was a little bit different because what was challenging was not translating the ambiguity, but translating chaos 
like it's a book about hysteria how do you translate hysteria so that it's legible and like is that even the goal and I think in translation there's always like inadvertent chaos that's introduced as well and so like how do you keep that separate should you keep that separate from like the original intended chaos that's in the book um, I think that's it for today but um, congratulations again to each of you um, and right now Son will read a little bit from the collection thank, thank you EJ thank you wow thank you. country whore there are a lot of Jinju Kiseng, but I've been told our family didn't have any the Jinju Kiseng who lived under the skirts of Mount Chiri have the longest history but our family only had chaste women, no kisang. When father reads from the family register, he lists nobles and scholars, no peasants, slaves, or merchants. One afternoon, we watched the Jinju Gyobang shaman dance in the Choksongmu pavilion. I met the eyes of a woman performing a sword dance. She was wearing socks and traditionally, traditional and brightly colored cloth covered her hands. How did we not have any kiseng in our family? That we didn't have a government slave aunt who plucked a kayagum with a fluffed heart when the moon rose by the window. A grandmother who killed herself because she didn't like attending to drinking parties. A beautiful slave girl mother and uncle who crossed rivers to peddle colorful silk. Or a peasant grandfather who used his sword out of contempt and scorn. That's so disappointing. How do we have an ancestor who saved the country every time we faced an insurrection, but not a single daughter who was sold off to be a kisang? It's suppressing. So where did the kisang in my mind come from? Tonight by the river, I want to sell inspiration. What to do with this decadence? My decadence would sell my soul for a single line of a poem. Which star is that gene stuck to? my adult entertainment, sword dancing every night. I'm no different than a physical horse strapped to the indenturement of a private loan. I'm a kisang, but I'm not a girl sold off for a sick mother. I'm a voluntarily obscene and debauched emotional whore. I wake up with the feeling of having done it, so I puke and drink and do it again. I shake my ruffled hair like a person coming to save the mood of a party. In a mess, I write something. I walk to the south side of the Jinju River. Tonight is a Yuding festival. Drunk people at the night market talk at me. National flags paint painted on paper lamps float above. They fall into the river and get tangled up. Lights float on the filthy breaths of people who spill out of the country market. They give life to the night. Disheveled and sleepy, I pull out my pen and bite. Unaware ink is dripping from my lips, I sit by the riverside and write something. I sob. I'm obsessed with the lines I write. I'm a mad woman who finally believes she is bound to poetry. The devil appears. He pulls down his pants in front of my eyes. I'll give you a line if you give me a suck. Is he really the devil? Even if he is, I will suck and suck and suck and suck and suck. I sleep and wake and walk outside. Without desperation, without shame, I bite a big pen and suck until poetry comes. I'm an emotion slut. When I say I'm a poet, it feels like I'm confessing I'm a whore. No one in our family sold themselves, father said. We never had blood like you. I stroke my pen and shake violently. I feel like an old filthy whore on a full moon night when the country festival is booming. I'm dancing, a sword in each hand.